In the last section, we looked at average rates of change. For instance, the average rate of change of position with respect to time is velocity. The average rate of change of velocity with respect to time is your average acceleration. Um, in this section, we would like to pass from the notion of an average rate of change to an instantaneous rate of change. So we'd like to say, oh, my velocity at a particular time, my instantaneous velocity at this time, not between two times. Um, we'd like to say what it is, as opposed to just discussing average velocities. The, um, the fundamental thing that you need to do this, to pass from average rates of change to instantaneous rates of change, is called a limit. Um, we're just going to have limits in a very informal way in this section. That's why it's a prelude to instantaneous rates of change. Um, the next section of the book will go into limits in detail, and then we'll do, after that section, we'll do a lot, many more examples. This section is just a prelude. It's just kind of a warm-up to the general discussion. So, um, suppose we return to the problem we first started looking at in the last section. You've got a car, and it's traveling down a straight road, and we've laid out some coordinate axis along the road, um, let's say in miles. And and we know which direction is a positive, it's a coordinate, there's a coordinate axis, so we know which direction is a positive direction, which direction is a negative direction. And we'll let P of t be the position, so as measured on the coordinate axis in miles, position in miles of the car um, at time t hours from some initial starting time that we don't care about. Out. And the question is, for instance, what is the velocity of the car when t is 1? So, if you're given the position as a function of time, can you say what the velocity is at time one hour? Well, you should be saying, what do you mean by velocity? Do you mean average velocity or instantaneous velocity? Well, I can't mean average velocity because you take the average velocity between two times, and I only gave one time. So, I must mean the instantaneous velocity. What does that mean? Well, inside the car, <laughs> it's kind of easy. From inside the car, you just notice whether you're traveling in the positive direction or the negative direction. And you look at the speedometer at time one hour, and it tells you what your speed is. And then if you're moving in the positive direction, your velocity is that speed. If you're moving in the negative direction, your velocity is negative that speed. So from inside the car, it's easy. So really the question is, how do you tell what the velocity is from outside the car? Or even more fundamentally, what does velocity mean? Um, what does the instantaneous velocity mean? This number that's appearing on your speedometer, what, what, is, what does it mean? So, um, we have average velocities. And what you would hope, suppose you want the, the velocity at time one hour. So you want to kind of measure from the outside of the car what the speedometer is telling you from inside the car, together with the direction information. And so you would think, oh, from outside the car, what can you do? Well, you can measure average rates of change. You can measure how far you've gone in some interval of time. So, for instance, we had the problem where we had a car at mile marker 37. So or at mile 37 at noon, and it was at mile 38 at 12.02 p.m. And we can ask, what's, what was the velocity of the car at noon?
Well, hopefully you realize that you don't have anywhere close to enough data to answer this question. Um, the best you could do is say what the average velocity was over a two minute period. The average velocity would be the change in position over the change in time, and this would be one mile divided by two minutes, that's one thirtieth of an hour. And so as we found before, this is 30 miles per hour. Great, so that's the average velocity over that two minute interval. The question is, can you use that to say, ah, the velocity of the car at noon was 30 miles an hour, something really close to 30. No, no, I mean, you're in a car. In two minutes, you could easily speed up or slow down or do lots of weird things, well, speed up and slow down multiple times. Um, you could have been going much faster than 30 miles per hour at noon and then slowed down. You could have been going much slower than 30 miles per hour at noon and then sped up. You could, you could have changed your speed multiple times. So, no, this average rate of change shouldn't be necessarily, I mean, it could be a good approximation of your instantaneous velocity at noon, what, what appeared on the, on the speedometer, always noting the direction, what appeared on the speedometer at noon, it could be, like maybe you had your cruise control on and you stayed at the same speed the whole time, but um, there's no way to know with this data. Well, what data would you like to know that would that would be would make you more confident that this average velocity approximated whatever was appearing on the speedometer better? Well, a smaller time interval um, would be good. Suppose instead of knowing where you were ten minutes or two minutes later, suppose instead you took the average velocity. between noon and 10 seconds later. Instead of two minutes, let's go with 10 seconds. Is this approximately equal to the, uh, the instantaneous velocity? at noon. Well, certainly 10 seconds is a lot shorter time interval than two minutes. And you go, oh, well, if I calculate the average velocity, so the change in position over the change in time, and only 10 seconds have gone by, then that velocity is, you could think, more likely to be closer to the actual velocity at noon. Well, I'm not sure that's reasonable. In, in 10 seconds in a car, you could slam on the brakes, you could stomp on the accelerator, you could do lots of things to change your velocity um, appreciably between noon and 10 seconds later. So that while it's possible that knowing um, your position at noon and your position at noon plus 10 seconds, it was possible that the, the average rate of change of the position with respect to time over that 10 second time interval gives you a good approximation of your velocity at noon, it's, you can't know without more data. What, what would we really need to know, to, uh, to know that an average rate of change is approximating your instantaneous velocity? Well, well you kind of have to use some interval of time that's small enough that you don't think that anything you could do from inside the car would really affect the velocity much. So maybe average velocity between noon and not 10 seconds, but a tenth of a second. How about that? Well, that's probably pretty good. If you actually knew your position at noon, and your position to a high degree of precision at noon plus a tenth of a second, and then you took the difference to get your change in position and divided by a tenth of a second, convert to hours if you want, then you'd get an average velocity that should be very close to what your actual velocity is at time noon, 
because there's not much you can do from inside a car to change the velocity appreciably in a tenth of a second. I'm not even sure, I'm not even sure how fast, what would happen if you smashed into a wall in a tenth of a second. The center of mass would probably keep traveling at a pretty good velocity during that time. Anyway, what's, okay, so if we really wanted to approximate the velocity of a car um, using average velocity and measuring from outside the car, yeah, maybe measure its position at some time, measure its position at that time plus a tenth of a second, take the change in position, divide by the change in time, get an average velocity over a tenth of a second interval, and just assume that that's a reasonable approximation to the actual velocity. Um, what's wrong with that? Well, there's nothing terribly wrong with it, but you know, if you're going to use a tenth of a second, why not use a hundredth of a second or a thousandth of a second? And so that's kind of annoying. Um, also, you know, we don't really want an approximation. What, what's the velocity at noon? But it's also true that we don't like that as kind of a notion of velocity, of instantaneous velocity, because we had to know something about a car. That in a tenth of a second, we don't believe a car could change its velocity any significant amount. Well, what if we want the velocity of, you know, particles or photons or atoms or something? Um, you know, it's, we don't want to always have to have physical knowledge of, of what we're talking about the velocity of in order to decide how you would get a reasonable calculation of its velocity. So what we'd like to do is be able to take this number to be arbitrarily small. So what am I saying? So we're looking at average rates of change. So the average velocity between some time, all right, t equals a, and t equals a plus some amount, plus some amount delta t, the change in time, or a favorite name for the change and the independent variable, when you're doing this kind of thing, has become h. So, where h is small, this is what we're talking about. It's, oh, you want to approximate the instantaneous velocity, you would calculate the average velocity between some time and some time plus a little bit. Small means small in absolute value, so close to zero where h is close to zero. What does that mean we're, we're looking at? We're looking at the position at time a plus h. We're dividing, uh, we're subtracting the position at time a. So that's your change in position. And then you divide by the change in time. So, And so you get this quantity. where h is, a, is delta t, the change in time. We're looking at this for small values of h. Um, and what we believe, hopefully, is that if h gets as close to zero as we want, that this number, which is the average velocity over smaller and smaller time intervals, gets closer and closer to something. And that something should be the velocity at time a. Right? So, that's what we want to do, and this is kind of fundamentally the notion of limit, which we're just going to talk about very informally in this section. So um, I'll write definition, but I'll put it in quotes. Suppose you've got a function, which I'm going to call Q, thinking of quotient. Suppose you've got a function of h, and we're thinking of a fixed time a and, and then letting h change, you have a function, q of h. And as h 
gets arbitrarily close to zero. So as close as you want. Um, Q of H gets arbitrarily close to a number L. Keep in mind what we're thinking. I'm thinking of Q of H right now as this quotient for the average rate of change, so for the average velocity. And, and H is the interval of time. And we're saying as the interval of time gets closer and closer to zero, suppose Q of H, the average velocity, is getting closer and closer to some number. Well, we believe that number then would be V velocity, and so, um, uh, so we want to define that as the instantaneous rate of change. So I first need to say, then we, so suppose those things are true. This isn't, the reason definition is in quotes is because gets arbitrarily close to, has to be made rigorous mathematically. You can't really prove anything with the words gets arbitrarily close to. Hopefully you have some intuition for it. Then we, we say that the limit as h approaches 0 of q of h equals L, and we write the limit as h approaches 0 of q of h equals L. Great. And what we want to do this for right now is for um, quotients of the form that we just looked at. Not necessarily just of position functions, but... Um, if f equals f of x and q of h is f of a plus h minus f of a over h. So exactly the kind of quotient you look at for the average rate of change. I'm just now saying it's just any function, f of x. So if we have some function f of x and we define q of h to be this, and, okay, too many ands, and the limit as h approaches 0 of this particular q of h equals l. So we're saying that the limit as h approaches 0 of this equals l. Well, this is an average rate of change, and we're taking the limit of it. Well, this is what we mean by the instantaneous rate of change. Then we say that the instantaneous rate of change, the IROC, the IROC, instantaneous rate of change of F with respect to X when X equals A equals L. And, and the mathematical name for this, um, so physically, that's what it is. It's the instantaneous rate of change of F when X is A. Um, mathematically, we call this This limit the limit as h approaches zero of f of a plus h minus f of a over h is called the derivative.
of f with respect to x at x equals a. And, and so, of course, I've used f and x now. But in our previous context, or in the context I was talking about, where your function is actually, was p of t instead of f of x, where its position is a function of time, um, this instantaneous rate of change of position with respect to time is called velocity. Um, before, um, before I say any more about that, I want to warn you about one thing. We are taking the limit of this as h approaches zero, even though we don't rigorously know what that means. It means as h gets arbitrarily close to zero, um, this gets arbitrarily close to something, which we're calling L. You might wonder, well, why don't you just take the interval of time or the change in x or t, the change in whatever the independent variable is, why don't you take it to be zero? Understand if you just let h be zero, you get something meaningless. You'll get f of a minus f of a over zero. Well, you'll get zero over zero. It's undefined. So you can't take h to be zero. <clears throat> but you can look at what happens as h gets closer and closer to zero. And that's how you should think of limit. Um, okay. Um, let's, so this is what we're going to use for um, our definition of, of the limit and the instantaneous rate of, well, in this section. So what we're going to use is our provisional definition of limit um, of the, and the instantaneous rate of change of a function. It's the limit of this quotient of average rate, uh, this limit of average rates of change. Let's look at a problem that's not velocity. Uh, I will end up with velocity problems, but let's look at an example um, that's we looked at that's related to what we looked at in the last section. Let's look at an example of a widescreen television. So, example, we had a widescreen television, so it's 16 by 9, so it's 16 by 9, and what we found in the last section was that the area, A, as a function of the diagonal, D, is 144, or 337, times D squared where d is the length of the diagonal. And now my question is, uh, I'll have two of them. What is the instantaneous rate of change, so the IROC, of A with respect to D when D equals 40. And after we do that, how about when D equals 52? All right, so what do, you, what do you do? Well, we're supposed to use our new definition of the instantaneous rate of change. So first of all, to simplify things a little bit, I'm going to call the constant 144 over 337, just C, until we plug it in at the end. So we've got we have um, A is, I'll just write C times D squared, where C is the constant 144 over 337. That'll just save me from having to write that over and over again. We have. So 
we want the instantaneous rate of change of the area with respect to the diagonal. And so what do you do? You take the limit of the average. You take the limit as h approaches 0 of the average rate of change. So uh, we're doing this at 40. Well, when d is 40. Um, 40 plus h um, minus the value at 40. So this is the change in the diagonal. Uh, that's, that's absolutely not true. The change in the area between um, when you've got a diagonal of 40 plus h inches and when you have a diagonal of 40 inches. And you divide by, well, it's h. But if you want, you can think 40 plus h minus 40. So we want to calculate this thing. So um, I want to emphasize that this is functional notation. This is a of 40 plus h. It's not a times 40 plus h. It means in the formula um, for a in terms of d, you plug in the quantity, 40 plus h, for d. So you take the limit as h approaches 0. All right. a of 40 plus h. So this is, let me write, this is a of d. a of 40 plus h. That means you're replacing the d by 40 plus h. So you replace that d by 40 plus h. And then you subtract a at 40. So C times 40 squared, and you divide by H. And what we'd like to know is, does this get arbitrarily close to something as H gets arbitrarily close to zero? Well, right now it's hard to say because as H gets arbitrarily close to zero, you think, oh, well, this gets closer and closer to zero. That gets closer and closer to zero. Oh, so the numerator is getting really close, arbitrarily close to zero. So is the denominator, so you're getting zero over zero. Well, you have to do some work so that you're not getting 0 over 0. So let's simplify this and then see what happens. See if we can tell what happens as h gets close to 0. So this is the limit as h approaches 0 of, you get c times, I'm going to expand this, uh, 40 squared, which I could write as 1600, but I won't, plus 80h plus h squared and then minus c times 40 squared, and then all divided by h. Well, now here's a c times 40 squared. The c is multiplied times all this stuff. Here's a, a c times 40 squared. We're subtracting a c times 40 squared, so those cancel. You're left with 80 times ch. plus c times h squared in the numerator, um, all divided by h. But now you can factor an h out of these terms in the numerator and divide by that h. You get the limit as h approaches 0 of 80c plus ch. 80. Okay, so you get this, and now it's easy to see what happens as h gets arbitrarily close to zero. As h gets arbitrarily close to zero, this gets arbitrarily close to zero, and you're just left with 80 times c. So this is 80 times 144 over 337. And that's the answer. That's the instantaneous rate of change of the, the area with respect to the diagonal when the diagonal is 40. OK, what changes if we change that to a 52? If we're, what's the instantaneous rate of change of the area with respect to the diagonal when the diagonal is 52? Well, you just redo everything. In every place I had a 40, you'll put in a 52. So, if you want this um, at 52, you put in 52, 
52, 52, 52. This will still be H. This will be 52. It's 52. 52. 52. 52. Now I have to be a little careful, and then there's 104. Another 52. And then you get the same cancellation, but here you'll have 104. Here you'll have 104. And so as h approaches 0, this part goes away, and you get 104. Let's see, or 104 times 144 divided by 337. So what you see is that you do the same calculation with 52 that you did for 40. It's just that every place that you had a 40 before, you put in a 52. Um, this gets a little annoying to do the same algebra over and over again. So what you can do is, and maybe I'll just write it where I had everything before, you can just do this at an arbitrary value of the diagonal. Just call it D from the beginning. Leave it as D and get your answer regardless of what D is. So then you can put in D is 40 later or D is 52 or D is whatever you want. If you just put D's everywhere and later plug in what you get, well, here we'd have a D, and here we'd have a D, and here we'd have a, a D squared, and the cross term is 2DH, that's, so we get plus 2DH, and here we'd have a D, and the CD squared here cancels with the CD squared here, so exactly what you're getting here is 2, you're getting 2DCH, 2 d CH plus C times H squared. You cancel the H. Um, so here you get 2D. And as H approaches 0, what you're getting here is 2DC. What's the same thing? 2D times 144 over 337. So now we know the instantaneous rate of change of the area with respect to the diagonal, no matter what the diagonal is. Somebody gives you the diagonal, you don't have to redo this calculation. You can plug in D is 40 if you want, D is 52 if you want, you'll get the numbers we just got, but you can plug in any D and you don't have to redo the algebra. <clears throat> so that's nice. It's nice that we can calculate the instantaneous rate of change, the derivative, just as a function of D itself instead of plugging in particular D values. So um, this gives you a derivative function, which is usually just referred to as the derivative. So let me make that definition. The, the difference between this and what I defined a little while ago was then I was thinking of a particular fixed value of the independent variable. But the point is, if you just do it just do this instantaneous rate of change calculation, this derivative calculation, for an arbitrary value of the variable, you get a new function, and that function gives you the instantaneous rate of change regardless of the value of the independent variable. So, um, so our definition, if you've got, if you've given y equals f of x, um, the new function and we give it some notation new function f prime that's how you read it f prime given by f prime of x equals the limit as h approaches 0 of f of x plus h minus f of x over h is called the derivative function, but we we'll say the derivative. 
of f with respect to x. Of course, its domain is just, so the x's you're allowed to plug in are just those x's for which this limit exists. So that might not be all of them. Um, what's the point of this? The point of this is f prime of x gives you the instantaneous rate of change. of f with respect to x at any x value for which it's defined. So over here, over here we would have, this is a prime of d, and what we calculated initially was we calculated a prime at 40, and we calculated a prime at 52. So you get this new function that gives you the instantaneous rate of change of your original function with respect to the independent variable. Um, OK, there is the question of can you see the instantaneous rate of change graphically? After all, we could see average rates of change. They were slopes of secant lines. How do you see instantaneous rates of change graphically? It's not bad if you just think about what's going on. So let's take this function still, where c is the constant 144 over 337, but I'm just going to draw your generic parabola, or part of it. So if you look at the graph of this function, here's d, a, the graph of this, at least for positive d's, it is a parabola. It's part of a parabola that curves upward, passes through the origin. And the question is, how could you see, if you're at some d value, like maybe this is d equals 20, how can you see graphically the instantaneous rate of change of the function? Well, what we saw graphically before was the average rate of change. The average rate of change between 20, between of A, between D equals 20 and D equals 20 plus H, you graph both points, both corresponding points on the graph. You connect them by a line. That's a secant line to the graph. And then the slope of this secant line um, gave you the average rate of change of A between 20 and 20 plus h. Well, what happens with instantaneous rates of change? We let h get closer and closer to zero. That means that what's happening up on, up in the lines is, so you're letting h get closer and closer to zero, which means these points down here on the x-axis, or the 20 plus h that I've got indicated here is getting closer and closer to 20. The corresponding points up on the graph Corresponding points up on the graph also get, get closer and closer to this point. And then you look at slopes of secant lines. Now I'm going to have trouble with the precision of this. But you take a secant line between here and here. And then, oh, you take another secant line between like here and here and here and here. And my ability to draw this gets worse and worse. But what's happening is you get a slope of a secant line, you get a slope of a secant line, a slope of a secant line. But these points are getting closer and closer to this one. And the secant line um, starts approaching this thing that just glances off of the graph. So let me try drawing that in a different color. So you get this thing in the end that just glances off of the graph at, at the one point. So, um, so if the, when we give that line a name, the limit of secant lines is 
is the tangent line. To the graph. In this example, that would be at the point when d is 20 and the other coordinate is whatever the value of a is at 20. I don't really care what the number is. Um, the tangent line point to that point at the graph. So you have these lines that just glance off the graph at various points. Um, more correctly, you know, or more rigorously, the tangent line to the graph at 20, A of 20, is the unique line containing the point, so containing twenty A of twenty with slope the instantaneous rate of change. So with slope A prime of twenty. So this is what the tangent line is at a point. It's the unique line that contains that point and whose slope is given by the derivative of the function at that point. But intuitively, it's the limit of secant lines. By the way, the fact that you're, you have a point that you know, and this instantaneous rate of change that you calculate the way we calculate it, means that for tangent lines, the data you have for the line is usually the point, a point on the line, and the slope. That means our preferred way of writing tangent lines um, in calculus is in point slope form in case you've forgotten if you've got um, if you've got a point and a slope so given a point x naught y naught so I'm going to switch to x and y since that's what everybody likes and a slope m um, then the point slope form of a line containing that point with slope m is y minus y naught equals m times x minus x naught. So this is how you'll normally write equations for tangent lines in a calculus class. So for instance, without even calculating the numbers a of 20 and a prime of 20, um, equation for this tangent line would be, um, well, it depends on whether you want to use the, uh, the variables a and d or the variables y and x. I'll use a and d now. Will be a minus, well, you should think a minus a naught equals the slope times d minus d naught. But what are all, all of these? Well, the a naught and the d naught, so this is point slope form of the line, the d naught, the given point, is 20 a of 20. So you'd have And then what, what's the slope? It's a prime at 20. So you'll get an equation that looks like this. Of course, we have a function a, and we calculate its derivative. So there's a number here and a number here. I'm just not filling them in. Okay, well that's how you graphically see um, the derivative. It's the slope of a tangent line, a line that just glances off the graph. We'll look at this many more times once we have a rigorous definition of derivative. Um, okay, I want to, uh, as I said, this is just a preliminary section, a warm-up for real instantaneous rates of change until, until we have the actual definition of limit. But I want to go ahead and say, you know, what does instantaneous velocity mean? What is instantaneous acceleration? What is instantaneous speed? And then I want to do two examples. Because, you know, velocity and acceleration are, are two, two of our more intuitive 
rates, instantaneous rates of change, ones that we're very familiar with in the real world, so it's nice to look at examples of those. So I just want to say very clearly at least once that if this is your position, on a straight line marked off with an axis, so this is just your coordinate on that axis um, position as a function of time, then, then the instantaneous velocity at time t. is p prime of t. So it's the instantaneous rate of change of the position function with respect to time. So it's in, in limits, it's the limit as h approaches 0 of p of t plus h minus p of t over h. And we would usually call that v of t, the velocity function. And it's instantaneous. In fact, if we say the velocity of something at a particular time, we mean instantaneous velocity. That's the only thing we could mean. There are no, there are no two times for which you could, you know, to get a time interval over which take a, an average velocity. If you just say the velocity of something at a time, it's the instantaneous velocity. So you could drop the word instantaneous if you want. I'm just saying that now to be very clear. The instantaneous acceleration is, well, it should be the instantaneous rate of change of your velocity with respect to time. But we gave the velocity function a name, so it's v prime of t. So it's the limit as h approaches 0 of v of t plus h minus v of t, all divided by h. The instantaneous speed is the derivative with respect to time of the distance traveled function. And it's not terribly hard to show this, which is the absolute value of the instantaneous velocity. So remember, speed, your speed is always greater than or equal to zero. And your velocity could be positive or negative. It includes, what velocity data includes a sign. A positive sign means you're traveling in the what you've designated as the positive direction. Negative sign means you're traveling in the negative direction. Um, the speed, if you want to write it, you, a lot of people would say the speed is the absolute value of velocity. Well, if we, that, that's fine. It's not wrong. Um, but if you want to say that your speed is the instantaneous rate of change of something with respect to time, that something is the distance traveled function as opposed to the position function. Those are very different the position and the distance traveled, if, if the object ever turns around, those are very different. Um, all right. So I just wanted to make those definitions once and for all. Uh, these are for objects traveling in a straight line. If you're in multivariable calculus and you're willing for everything to be vectors, uh, these are still correct. Um, it's just you'd be in a more general context. All right.
I want to look at two examples of velocity as a function of time. I want to do one easy one, and then I want to do one where the algebra is terrible, and then make a point about that. So one of the problems, so Example. Particle. A particle's position in meters is given by P of T equals 5t squared minus 40t at time t seconds. Um, find find v of t, the velocity function of the particle, and determine all times at which the particle stops. And this is stops instantaneously. It may only be stopped for an instant in time. Okay. Well, this means we need to calculate the derivative of this, and then we need, that'll give us v of t, and then we'll set v of t equal to zero and solve for t. Um, if you've had calculus before, you probably learned a bunch of rules for calculating derivatives, which lets you do it very quickly. One of the problems with that is that people get so used to the rules, they think it's what derivative means. No, the der the derivative is this limit of average rates of change, and that's why the derivative gives you an instantaneous rate of change. So um, the reason the derivative is something we want to calculate is because it's the limit of average rates of change, and that makes it the instantaneous rate of change. The rules let us calculate quickly. If you don't know what I'm talking about when I say the rules, fine, you will before too long. So we want v of t, the velocity, as a function of time. It's the limit as h approaches zero of p of t plus h minus p of t all divided by h. So you plug in, t, so under, I'll write this again, p of t is 5t squared minus 40t. This is not multiplication, this is p of the quantity t plus h. It means where this had a t, you plug in the quantity t plus h. That means you replace that t by the quantity t plus h and that t by the quantity t plus h. So you get the limit as h approaches 0 of 5 times t plus h squared minus 40 times t plus h minus p of t, so minus 5t squared, and then minus minus 40t, so plus 40t all divided by h. And we want to know what this equals. What you can't do is say, oh, well, h is 0, because then you'll get 0 in the numerator and 0 in the denominator. You have to do some algebra. You have to do something so that when you put in h is 0, you, um, you know, when you think, oh, h gets arbitrarily close to 0, you don't end up with some 0 over 0 thing. So um, what do you get? Well, you expand that numerator and try to cancel some stuff. So you get 5 times t squared, and then there's a 2th times 5, so plus a 10th, plus a 5h squared. Then there's minus 40t, minus 40h, minus 5t squared, 
plus 40t, all divided by h. Here's a, a 5t squared minus 5t squared. So those, those cancel. Here's a minus 40t and a plus 40t. So those cancel. Everything else has an h in it, and we can divide by this h down here. So you factor an h out of each of those terms and cancel with an h down here, and you're left with the limit as h approaches 0 of 10t plus 5h minus 40. And the question is, as h gets closer and closer to 0, does this get closer and closer to anything? Yes. This part will get close to 0 when you're left with 10t minus 40. So that's the derivative. I, and I should have emphasized before, but I'll say it now. The units on average rates of change are these units divided by these units. So p units divided by t units. So in this problem, meters per second. And so that's, that's, those are the units you get on the derivative, too. It's always the units of the function divided by the units of the vari variable. So this is in meters per second. This is the velocity, v of t, at any time t. So for instance, initially, at time 0, the particle was moving at negative 40 meters per second, which means its speed was 40 meters per second but in the negative direction. <coughs> when does the particle stop? You set this equal to 0 and solve for t. v of t equals 0 when t is 4 seconds. So that's what you do. Um, these limits can be bad to calculate algebraically, and we will develop a lot of rules. As an example of how bad they can be, I want to do one more complicated one. Um, <laughs> this will be a mess. I'm, I'd say that I'm not trying to scare you, but in fact, I am kind of trying to scare you. I want you to know that, yeah, the definition of derivative is what makes it the instantaneous rate of change. And it, so that's why it's something we want to calculate. The rules are just something that lets you calculate easily. And, the reason we want them is because otherwise these problems can take a long, long time. So suppose you've got a particle and its position is given by 1 over the square root of t cubed plus 1. Find the velocity function. This is going to be fairly nightmarish, <laughs> but let's do it. So this doesn't change. You write the same thing there. It's just our function p of t is now a different function. And there'll be some algebra steps here that the steps themselves probably, you'll understand the algebra, but thinking to do that algebra is the hard part. And you won't get any better at it without practice. So, so we've got this. OK. So this is the limit as h approaches 0. p of t plus h. You replace that t by the quantity t plus h. So we get 1 over the square root of t plus h cubed plus 1 minus p of t. 1 over the square root of t cubed plus 1 all divided by h. <laughs> what we'd like to know is as h gets really close to 0, does this get really close to something? Well, you can't just say, oh, let h be 0, because as always, you'd get 0 over 0. We have to do a lot of algebra. Now, at least this first step may be fairly obvious. You get a common denominator in this numerator. That'll just be this square root times that square root. Um, and so fairly quickly, algebraically, you should see that what you get is, so here you'd need to multiply the numerator and denominator by this denominator. So you'd get a, a square root of t cubed plus 1. Here you multiply this denominator by that one. Uh, and so you have to multiply the numerator by that one. Minus a t plus h cubed plus 1. That is all divided by the product of these two and an h. So an h times t plus h cubed 
plus 1 times the square root t cubed plus 1. Yuck! <laughs> that isn't a, not, a lot better looking. You might go, okay, maybe I can just say, oh, when h is really close to 0 now and think, oh, I just let h be 0. No, it's still true if you let h be 0. In the numerator you get 0, in the denominator you get 0. You have to get rid of this division by h. Because if you're just thinking, well, when h is really close to 0, and you just want to say, oh, what if h is 0? This is the one that's screwing you up, or at least part of it. So what we need to do is somehow factor out an h in the numerator and cancel it with this one in the denominator. But how the hell do you factor out something like this? It's the a difference of square roots. Well, either you've seen this before, or it occurs to you, or it's um, not obvious what you do, but you multiply the numerator and denominator by the same thing, so you haven't changed the fraction. You multiply by 1, but in a clever way. And the clever way is to multiply by what's known as the conjugate of this. Multiply by t cubed plus 1 plus the square root of t plus h cubed plus 1. And if you multiply the numerator by that, you have to multiply the denominator by that. Why on earth would you do that? Isn't that going to make things look a lot worse? Well, that's unclear, but certainly algebraically you're allowed to do it. But why would you want to? And the reason you'd want to is because this is something minus something, and here's the same something, but plus that. When you multiply those two together, you should remember a difference of squares. This is a minus b times a plus b is a squared minus b squared. So that'll give you this squared minus this squared, but squaring will get rid of the square roots, which are what are, what are really making our lives complicated. So the denominator just sits there being hideous, but the numerator gets better. So you get the limit as h approaches 0 in the numerator. You just get the first thing squared minus the second thing squared, and the squaring gets rid of the square roots. So you get this minus, you get t plus 1, you get t cubed plus 1 minus t cubed plus, uh, t plus h cubed plus 1. And all of this is divided by this nasty, nasty denominator, which looks like h times the square root of t plus h cubed plus 1 times the square root of t cubed plus 1 times the square root of t cubed plus 1 plus the square root of t plus h cubed plus 1. Uh-huh. <laughs> All right. It may not be clear that we're getting anywhere, but we are. We now have to expand this cube up here. And then stuff will cancel, and every remaining term will have an h in it. We will factor out that h, cancel it with this one, and then we can just say, ah, as h gets close to 0, then we'll just be able to say, oh, in fact, if h is 0, we get something that's defined, and that'll be the derivative. Rather than rewrite this, I'm just going to expand this in place. So t plus h cubed plus 1. You may not know how to cube a sum, but t plus h quantity cubed. If you multiply it out, you'll get t cubed plus 3t squared h plus 3th squared plus h cubed. And then we had plus 1. And all of that is subtracted. <coughs> the t cubes cancel, the 1's cancel, and every, other, every remaining term has an h in it. So you get the limit as h approaches 0 of minus... 3t squared h minus 3th squared minus h cubed. And then it's all divided by <laughs> that same denominator. I'm just going to write same denominator. And then. But then what happens? You can factor an h out of each of these terms and cancel it with an h there. So what we end up with is the limit as h approaches 0 of, all right, I'm canceling an h in each term, minus 3t squared, minus 3th, minus h squared. 
And I lost an H in the denominator, but that was the only thing that went away. So I still have these ugly things, T plus H cubed, the square root of T plus H cubed plus 1, the square root of T cubed plus 1, and the sum, square root of T cubed plus 1, plus the square root of T plus H cubed plus 1. Uh-huh. Finally, as h approaches 0, we can just say, oh, in fact, I could just let h be 0 now, and it wouldn't cause a problem. If you think, what does this get closer and closer to as h approaches 0? That goes to 0. This part gets closer and closer to 0. This looks like t cubed plus 1, the square root of t cubed plus 1. There's another square root of t cubed plus 1. This is the square root of t cubed plus 1 added to itself, so two times. So at this point, you can figure out the limit. It is, I think I'm going to fit it right here, that all this comes out to equal in the numerator, all you're left with is minus 3t squared. And in the denominator, what you get is the square root of t cubed plus 1, another square root of t cubed plus 1, multiply together, so that's t cubed plus 1, then times, two times, so you get two of these, 2 times the square root of t cubed plus 1. So you get 2 times, I'll write, t cubed plus 1 to the 3 halves power. That's a t cubed plus 1 times a square root of t cubed plus 1. That's what we're getting for the velocity. That's the velocity function. <laughs> we had to do a lot of algebra. The point of doing this ridiculous, uh, this complicated example at the end is to look, to say what I'm about to say, which is, yes, we're going to have some rules, a collection of rules that'll make obtaining this answer very fast and very easy. But never forget that the definition of the derivative is what makes it the instantaneous rate of change. It's the limit of average rates of change. So the fact <laughs> that it's defined to be this limit of the change in the position over the change in time as the change in time approaches zero is uh, what makes it important to us and makes it something we want to calculate. And that's why we want to have rules for doing it quickly so that we don't have to do a whole bunch of math like this. We'll look at a lot more examples of this after we do the next section and make the, the definition of limit more rigorous or rigorous.